I have good news and bad news. I will start with the bad news. Today, more than 800 million people are going to bed hungry. And the numbers are increasing every single day. Women and girls, men and boys around the world simply do not have enough to eat because wars and conflicts force them to flee and leave their crops on the fields unharvested, because food is deliberately kept from them, used as a cynical weapon of war, because climate change caused by the global north kills animals and turns fields into swamps or deserts in the global south, because the greed of a few fossil fuel companies and industries tips the delicate balance of nature these people have known for generations. Because our world has become so unequal that two billion people cannot even afford to buy the healthy food they need. However, I also have good news. There is enough food for everyone on this planet. Organizations like ours are working every day to ensure that everyone has access to food because this is a basic human right for every child and grown up on this planet. Today, we're launching the fifth edition of the Human Rights Film Festival Berlin. For the next 10 days and through over 40 documentaries, we will show you stories of people who risk everything for their convictions, who fight for their freedom and show us that a better future is possible. Listening to these people's stories, I know that we can make a change. I know that telling stories is a powerful tool in the fight for a better future, but it is not enough. That is why here in Berlin, we bring together change makers and help them start a movement to rethink how we talk about hunger and how we can fight it. If all of us come together, bundle our resources and start a movement, we can rebalance the scales. Together Against Hunger is part of making sure that nobody gets left behind and nobody goes to bed hungry. My name is Jan. I'm joined by my colleagues from Action Against Hunger Germany and the Human Rights Film Festival Berlin. We are part of this movement to make hunger a thing of the past. No more bad news. Will you join us? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning to our online streaming audience. We are delighted to have you. Uh, we are now at 27 countries streaming live. So let's give a round. <laughs> Thank you also for those here in person. We had a glorious sunny day yesterday. A little overcast and gloomy today, but our future was still remains bright. Um, before we talk a little bit about the day and some reflections, guess what? It's time for some data collection. So, you've heard it from me before. Live polling is now open. Scan your QR code, go to menti.com, enter the code, or click on the URL. We have a couple questions this morning. Let's do the first one, please. Do you think the number of people experiencing hunger will continue to increase in the next five years? Yes or no? Let's see what the results say. So 24 of us, 24% of us say that's true. Some of us say no. Okay, what are we gonna do about that? Second question. Oh, we're still collecting. Data, I think, Dave. All right, second question. Do you think current approaches are sufficient to eliminating hunger 
in all forms. An overwhelming no. There's still some optimism that there is a possibility of current approaches. And our third question. Do you think the current approaches, oh, oh, which of the following innovations could significantly boost progress toward SDG zero hunger? Number one, oh, sorry, can we go back to that last one, please? Number one was innovative partnerships. It's a little bit of what we're here about today at Together Against Hunger. Innovative technologies. Innovative food loss and waste solutions. New ways of doing service delivery. Financing mechanisms. And data collection and knowledge sharing. So keep, when you, some of you are saying in the room that you don't have the question, so boot up, resubmit, and you'll get to that question. It just, it'll get there. Keep, keep on filling in that live polling data and move around. I guess innovative technology means I have to be a Luddite, I mean, to figure out how to do it. So we're starting to see some numbers coming in. You can move them around, keep prioritizing. How do people feel about this question? Getting there? Warming everyone up? Here we go, fully populated. Ooh, things are moving, things are moving. This is good. Innovative partnerships still remaining at the top. So one of the key things that we hope for Together Against Hunger is that you have found a new colleague. You have exchanged the Rolodex, or if you're an old school generation person, or you've taken a a picture of their card and you've gotten their name, put them in your contacts. Part of our going forward will be, so what do we do with this? How do we take creativity, innovation, new commitments, how do we make this become real with real action? So this isn't just a talking exercise. And I think we have one last question, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, nope, that's it. So part of the objective of our live polling is that we hope in time we'll go back and look at where we began and where we started this conversation. So I was asked to give some reflections of day one. And uh, colleagues from the production team says, oh, write a script, Suzanne. And I said, oh, gosh, I'm not really good at that. I haven't looked at my cards yet. Um, and so I spent the night trying to write a very scripted, formal reflection. And I couldn't do it, in part because what we've been trying to do at Together Against Hunger is not easy. There's a high degree of messiness that we've been asked to embrace. Because if we had a way to solve hunger, to address and to imagine a world free of hunger, we would have done it by now. So in the reflections, I heard a couple things yesterday that uh, a colleague mentioned he got a little bit of a gut punch because he went back and he was looking at his proposals or his website. And Yusuf taught us, and Marshall taught us, that words matter. I've written the word empower in hundreds of proposals. Well, now I can't look at the word the same way because now I have to reflect 
Well, what does that mean? Do I have power? I'm, I'm giving it? No, 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 that's not what I intended. So I'm having all these conversations. It is messy. I also heard that um, we aren't being radical. We haven't started a revolution. And I also heard that I don't want to be here in two years, five years, having the same conversation. So then I got a little low, and I said, oh, God, you know, I become complacent. This isn't the right space. But then I heard some other things. I didn't know I had an inner Eber in me. I didn't know I had an inner Kate in me. I heard great comments from former bosses, current bosses, former colleagues, new colleagues that said, we got to do something. I heard, I love our name badge because it just says my first name. And I am a first name kind of guy and in a room of colleagues. I heard how great it was to actually see one another. And to our colleagues online, I read all of your chats last night, and I am so excited, so excited to hear the outcry from the Philippines, from India, from Kenya. You guys are great. You have given me energy. And I'm very, very humbled by that. So where does this lead us? I don't know. Some of you have asked, well, is there going to be something at the end here? Is this going to, can you take a box, you know, it's, make sure it's a box, put something in, can you give me a bow on it? The production teams have asked me for a script. Jackie's asked me, let's put a bow on this. And I have said, I'm a really bad gift wrapper. I don't have a bow. Uh, Tim this morning was looking for a box, and he couldn't find a box. So that's a little out-of-the-box thinking. Oh, that's kind of cool. That's kind of good. So here's what I would end with by saying, together against hunger, we've struggled by calling this, is it a conference? Is it a summit? Is it an event? We've been gravitating to, okay, we're practitioners. We don't... We, we like to get our work done. We, we don't start movements. But we're asking ourselves, maybe we can do something differently. So I would only ask that, and I'm going to share it with you, that I'm going to embrace this. Where Together Against Hunger goes after this is up to each of us. If you don't want to be in the same room two years from now, having the same conversation, then change. Do something different. I know I'm not going to use the word empower in the next proposal I write without looking at that word in a new way. I know that when someone tells me and I'm in a grocery store, we have a climate crisis, I'm going to say, well, you know, it's also a hunger crisis. I know that my discomfort of working in the entire food system is something I have to struggle with. I have to sort of say, okay, Roy, if Roy Steiner can commit saying his endowment comes from the oil and gas companies, I got to get comfortable with this. I got to get comfortable with working with the corporate. I got to embrace this if I'm being authentic. So Together Against Hunger was a personal invitation to each of you in this room and online. Take the first step in starting this ripple, this pebble, whatever imagery will excite you. But if we're honest about this, let's take a risk. Why can't we have a world free of hunger? Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. And now, give a warm welcome to Jerry Greenfield and Raj Kumar.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. I'm Raj Kumar. I'm the president and editor-in-chief of DevX. I get to do lots of this kind of thing, but this is a special one. Uh, this is a really exciting moment, I think, for all of us here to be both rethinking what do we mean by this fight against hunger, how do we change the, the, really the mental models we use in this space, and to get to talk to somebody, uh, to have a conversation with someone who has really changed the way we all think, I think, about business and about many things. Uh, Jerry Greenfield is with me. He, you know him better as the Jerry in Ben and Jerry's. Um, I don't think that needs much of an introduction. But um, you really changed the world in a lot of ways, in, in addition to coming into all of our homes. Uh, who here eats Ben and Jerry's ice cream? I'm guessing just about every single person in this room. Um, you know this. I Thank you. I, I don't need to say much. <laughs> uh, but your story is incredible. And I thought we could just start there. I know we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about undernutrition. We're going to talk about hunger and the mm -hmm. fight. But I just want to start with the story of Ben and Jerry's. I think in college you were an ice cream scooper. I was. I was. First, I want to say how thrilled I am to be here and what an honor it is. Thank you guys so much for having me, and thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, ben and I are friends from junior high school, uh, so we met when we were 13. Ben dropped out of about three colleges. I got rejected from about 20 medical schools that I applied to, so we were kind of failures. We opened up a homemade ice cream parlor in 1978 in Burlington, Vermont, in a renovated gas station. And I understand you partly did that because when you looked at southern states, there were lots of ice cream parlors in college towns, but up in Burlington, because it's cold, nobody had thought to open an ice cream parlor. We were much better off in a place with no competition. Uh, so we learned how to make ice cream from a $5 correspondence course, had no business background, thought we would do an ice cream shop for a couple of years, and then thought we would do something else. Uh, so we opened in 1978. Because it was cold, the ice cream parlor struggled. We sold ice cream to some local restaurants. That struggled. And a few years later, we started packaging ice cream into pint containers for sale out of grocery stores. And, and that really changed the trajectory of the business. And along the way, we started, I guess, evolving our ideas about how a business fits into the community. Uh, we actually almost sold the business mm -hmm. after a few years because uh, we, Ben and I are kids of the 60s, peace, love, all that, right? And, and to us, business, had all these negative connotations. It took advantage of its employees. It spoiled the environment. And you started making money and feeling guilty about it? Uh, yeah, and, and Ben ran into a friend of his who convinced him that if there was something he didn't like about the way business was done, he could just change it. Hmm. And so we made a conscious decision when we first raised money. We did it by selling stock in the company to Vermonters, uh, the idea being that if the community was owners of the business, as the business prospered, the community would prosper and not be dependent upon the business's kindness or generosity. Uh, soon thereafter, we set up a charitable foundation that received 7.5% of the company's pre-tax profits, which was the highest percentage of any publicly held company. And then, of course, we didn't have enough money to give away, no matter how much it was. You guys understand this, right? And uh, so we began to understand that the, the real power of the business was in how we operated day to day, hmm. how we sourced ingredients, how we did our marketing, all, all the money that flows through your company is in how you, you know, how you do stuff. It's not how much you can give away. Give away. This is what nowadays we would call ESG, but of course that didn't exist back then, right? Yeah. You know, I think I think the key for Ben and Jerry's was uh, writing a mission statement, which we did in 1988. So that was we started in 1978, ten years after we started. And the mission statement, the company has a three-part mission product mission, an economic mission, and a social mission. 
So it's a stated mission, and all three of those missions are equally important, equally interdependent. Uh, but there's got to be a tension among them, right? You know, people talk about a tension or a balance, and I think what we've tried to do is to find ways where those missions support each other. You know, initially when we were doing it, there was there was pushback from within the company. If we take company energy and resources to give back to the community, that takes away from our ability to make money. And, uh, you know, after thinking about it, we realized that there were ways you could combine those things together and that they are mutually supportive. It's, as they say, it's a false dichotomy, mm -hmm. right? You can't. You can't choose. And you know, I, th I think what Ben and Jerry's has finally come to realize is that probably its most powerful tool is its voice. That when businesses talk, people listen, other businesses listen, politicians listen. And so Ben and Jerry's now uh, is very active in campaigns. Uh, around issues it cares about. What it typically does is partner with nonprofit organizations on the ground who are doing the work. The company uses its communications abilities and its ice cream to try to engage folks in those initiatives. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a second. Was there a moment where you thought the ethical side of the business was actually good for business? Like, was there a, was there a moment when that clicked, when you said, Wow, by doing good things in the community, this is actually helping. People are buying more ice cream, or we can charge higher prices. Did that happen at some point in this evolution? Uh, well, so first of all, that's true, uh, although not everybody believes it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's kind of common sense as you support the community, the community supports you. This is not like rocket science. I, don't <clears throat> I think it's still not accepted within the business world at large, mm -hmm. but it is definitely good for business. And, and the funny part about it is uh, for Ben and Jerry's, the company is uh, sometimes taking controversial stands on issues, issues that not everybody agrees with. And so to a certain degree, the company is pissing people off. Uh, and those people write in and say, I'm never going to buy your ice cream again, and, and so on and so forth. And yet, the company continues to sell more ice cream and continues to make more money. Yeah, in some ways, that's the niche, right? And as you, you, know, you don't need everybody to buy your ice cream. You just need the people who care about what you're doing to buy it. And speaking about controversy, probably a lot of people here have followed the fact that there's a lawsuit going on. You're basically suing your own company in a way right now. Uh, I know you probably can't get into that in, in any detail here in public, but um, you know, you, when you sold the company to Unilever, part of what you did was to try to safeguard the values of the company, created an independent advisory group. Mm -hmm. And you know, your feeling now is that the company Unilever isn't listening to that independent advisory group, and so you're suing over it, right? Um, so it's not so easy, I guess, is what I'm saying. It's not so easy to say, hey, we're going to take these ethical stands and, and we'll just do that and everything will be fine. I mean, it's, it's now it's all the way at the point of litigation. Yeah, so it's not easy. And that's a good thing, right? I mean, uh, Ben and Jerry's does a lot of things that, that are not easy. Uh, putting big chunks of cookies and candies into ice cream is not easy. That's why no other ice cream companies are doing it. Having a three-part mission where you're trying to integrate social and environmental concerns into your day-to-day -day business is not easy. Uh, you know, you're, you're asking folks within the company to not just think about price and quality and time of delivery, you're asking them to also think about impact, social and environmental impact. So, you know, for business people and managers, they want to make things more manageable. They want to make it easier for people to think about it. And, 
And when you're asking people to think about more things, that makes it less manageable. However, for people that support the mission, it's very motivating. They're not there just doing a job. They're there helping to achieve their own values and their own beliefs within their work. So, so that's great. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of news recently about Patagonia, right? Uh, the yeah. founder, Yvonne Chouinard, has moved it into a new structure that will hopefully allow it to preserve its mission as, as you tried to do with Ben & Jerry's. Are these the exceptions that prove the rule? <laughs> you know, the, one of the conversations and themes at this, at this session is, can the private sector really be the partner that many in the NGO community, people working on hunger, need it to be, want it to be? Are these just the exceptions? And in, in the end, there's so much greenwashing or whatever the equivalent might be around food and hunger that really the problem is coming from big corporates uh, in the food space and that, that you can't just partner and find a way forward. How do you think about that? How should people who work on these issues think about that? Well, so first of all, what Patagonia did was incredible. Uh, and they, you know, they, they have been a values-led company since their inception, uh, like probably sometime in the 1970s. Uh, and I think at the time they started doing it, at the time Ben & Jerry started doing it, uh, those companies were somewhat pioneering companies and it was extremely unusual. Uh, it's less unusual now. I don't think the lead in those, in those areas of being values led are gonna be uh, done by big corporations. They're gonna be led by smaller entrepreneurial companies, but it's certainly a growing theme. Uh, and, and the reason is, is because those companies are financial success, uh, financially successful. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't be a wonderful, caring, giving company if you're not also making money. You have to be sustainable. But what companies like Patagonia, what companies like Ben & Jerry show is that th those two things support each other, that they don't work against each other. and. You know, I think, I think for large companies, I mean, let's face it, they are driven by profitability. Uh, particularly for publicly held companies, the way they measure their success is, is very single-minded. Mm -hmm. It's profitability. And so to the degree that it makes sense for them to get involved in social issues, social movements, uh, they'll do it. And I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, Unilever, the corporate parent of Ben & Jerry's, is very involved in reducing food waste. Uh, they've actually gotten criticized recently. Uh, they, they, they try to have all their brands have purpose. They think that's helpful for the success of the company. And, and some of the analysts, the financial analysts, are skeptical. They say, why does Hellman's mayonnaise need to have a purpose? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, I think it's, you, you get criticized for it. I mean, Paul Pullman, who was the CEO of Unilever, was very outspoken on these issues. He came under a lot of flack from shareholders, ultimately left the company. You think about the Emmanuel Farber, the CEO of Danone, similar thing, right? He tried to really push that company and he was pushed out by shareholders. I guess thinking about Patagonia, do you wish you hadn't sold to Unilever in the end? I mean, Patagonia, you know, is such an interesting example because now they're able to preserve it. They don't have to do what you had to do, create right. this independent right. advisory board and, and now sue, you know, the company that bought Ben & Jerry's. Do you wish if you could do it all over again, you would have just kept it independent and... You know, it's, it, it's a great question and certainly one Ben and I have, have thought a lot about. Uh, you know, at the time we, we tried to, as you say, uh, 
embed the values of the company into the agreement we made with Unilever. We did what we thought was going to preserve those values. And, you know, hopefully, I mean, if, if you look at what Ben and Jerry's has done, uh, oh, I don't know, the last several years, uh, the company uh, publicly supported Occupy Wall Street, which was essentially an anti-corporate movement. The company in 2016 publicly supported the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, the company came out with a flavor, changed the world in partnership with Colin Kaepernick. Right? I think you all may have eaten that last night at the reception, for those who were here. And you know, Colin Kaepernick is this very polarizing figure, uh, a, a, a social activist who, a former football player, very outspoken uh, and protesting police violence, systemic racism, uh, essentially got kicked out of uh, the National Football League. Uh, and, you know, he, he talks about not just uh, police violence, but liberation of black and brown people. I mean, this is a guy who's not pulling punches and the fact that Ben and Jerry's can come out with a flavor supporting him, I think is amazing. And one of the reasons we wanted to talk about that backstory and those values is because you know, this conference is really thinking about really fundamental questions in the movement to fight hunger. You know, how can we rethink the way we actually approach this? And there's a sense maybe that even very well-intentioned not-for-profit organizations, government agencies, UN agencies, have gotten a little bit stuck in their approaches, in their mindset. You know, there's a certain bureaucracy that comes to play when their funding comes from foundations and governments and when you've been doing it for a long time. Is there some advice you can give to this community to, to move from traditional implementation of hunger programs to kind of taking a more radical stand? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I understand what happens. You know, as Ben would say, there's an inexorable push towards the mainstream to not take risks, to, to not be doing things that are different from other people. And uh, you just have to fight against it. You, uh, you need to be willing to stay true to your values and to take risks. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting in the business world, uh, businesses understand you need to take risks and they're very comfortable taking risks in terms of making new products uh, and having those not work out. But when a business thinks about, am I willing to take a risk in terms of uh, addressing social concerns or speaking out against issues, they don't want to make a mistake in that area. They become very risk averse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to be willing to try new things. You have to be willing to make mistakes. I mean, it's like new flavors at Ben and Jerry's, you know, most new flavors never see the light of day. They never get out of the lab. You just have to keep trying things and trying things and you make mistakes and you learn from it and you make mistakes and, and you try again. And, and the process of innovation is the same for making new flavors as it is for anything else. You know, I mentioned when Ben and Jerry's first started undertaking a social mission. We had no idea how to do it. And so we tried some things, usually they didn't work, and we tried them again, and uh, you know, eventually you start making some progress. I think one of the themes behind Ben and Jerry's is this idea of authenticity. You know, if you really think this, if you really support Colin Kaepernick, then you go out there and you do something about it, you say something about it. And I, I'm trying to think of the equivalent for this community, and I think it's probably speaking up about things that may be, you know, the equivalent of your customers, the, the equivalent of your ice cream customers, in this case might be your funders, you know, speaking back to your philanthropists and to your, 
individual donors and to your corporate partners and to USAID and the World Bank and others in the space and saying, you know, you're wrong, your policy is wrong or you're not doing enough and being willing to do that out loud. What would you say to people who worry about using their voice in that way and, and think, well, that, that's gonna sink us, isn't it? You know, that, that's too much of a risk. Well, so, you know, I think in the business world, uh, there's the idea of being uh, values-led versus market-driven. Uh, and, you know, so values-led, you're taking what you believe in and you're basing your strategy and your decisions on that as opposed to what you think customers are gonna buy. And I, I would guess that, that in the NGO world, it's, it's similar to uh, doing what you believe is right rather than chasing where the money is. Yeah. Uh, and you know, for Ben and Jerry's, the company has been values led uh, it's often done things that are not really validated yet in the marketplace. When, when Ben & Jerry's uh, first started doing a lot of plant-based, vegan, non-dairy, uh, frozen desserts, it was not really established. Uh, but it's what the company believed in. Same, same when the company was doing fair trade or committing to going to non-GMO ingredients. Uh, there's not a whole lot of demand for those things. I mean, it's, it's sort of niche things, but over time, if it's based on what your values and beliefs are, it, it builds up. You know, it's, it's really funny when I talk about non-GMOs because uh, at the time Ben and Jerry's went to non-GMO, we were actively campaigning to have mandatory labeling for GMO ingredients in food products. And, and uh, Unilever, our corporate parent, was leading the food trade group that was trying to uh, make sure that never happened. So it was uh, it's an interesting dance. I'm sure, yeah. And I mean, that is still one of the most controversial questions, including in a community like this, whether or not to support GMO, but the fact that yeah, you, you're willing to take that risk as a company. Uh, and yeah, and it was it not there. about supporting GMO, it was about having your customers have the right to know. Mm -hmm. uh, labeling, just let people know what they're putting into their bodies. Part of what this event is trying to do is to spark a movement. And that's a very particular word, right? Um, and I wonder whether you think there's room in this world, which is so polarized, to really create a movement from institutions, whether it's businesses or whether it's not-for-profits or government agencies. Can, can we really create a movement and what would that look like? Do you have any thoughts about how to spark something like that in a community like this? You know, so for a movement, a social movement, to me, what that talks about is social, connecting with people. And that's actually something the corporate world does very well. Messaging, I mean, in the corporate world, we call it marketing, trying to sell products and services to people. And uh, oftentimes, they don't even know they need it or want it. Uh, and, and that's kind of the beauty of business, is that they understand this is kind of the lifeblood of what they do. And I think it's probably not that different from the world of NGOs. That messaging, what, what we would at Ben & Jerry's call communicating, connecting, uh, is, is critical. And I think, I also believe that, that for the NGO world, you need to connect with businesses as well. When you think about business uh, and the role that it plays in our society, that it, it's probably the most powerful force that exists in our society. And, and to have a movement as, as 
critical and bold and ambitious. I think we need to find a way to partner with business as well and let help business understand that it's going to be good for their bottom line. You know, it's funny, what, what Ben and I sometimes talk about to business groups is spirituality in business, you know, which is not kind of your normal business talk, uh, but it, it's, it's a universal law. As you help others, you are helped in return. We're all interconnected. You know, the, the good that you do comes back to you. And helping businesses understand this and demonstrate it to themselves, I think is gonna be a really important part of a social movement. Yeah, well, at an event like this years ago, I sat next to somebody from McDonald's who told me they made apples an option, just an option, sliced apple in the Happy Meal. And that day, they went to being the world's largest consumer of apples. Right, the scale is just incredible when you yeah. think of these businesses yeah. and what they can do. I think the other thing that you, you, you touched on, but that's really relevant to this community, is, yeah, maybe the term is marketing, but you've sort of built a community at Ben & Jerry's where people feel connected to the company. They sort of feel like it's theirs in a way, right? That brand association is really powerful. And I think in, in this community, often the idea is, well, we're gonna solve someone else's problem. We use terms like beneficiary. You know, if it's a hungry person, we're gonna solve their problem, as opposed to kind of making them part of the solution too. And I, I wonder if you have a thought about how that dynamic can, can maybe affect this movement to fight hunger. So Ben and Jerry's uh, sometimes described itself as an aspiring social justice company. Aspiring is the key word, of course. Uh, but when we're at our best, we're not selling ice cream to consumers. We are partnering with our fans uh, over shared values to bring about a world that we all believe in. And ice cream is a vehicle for that. I mean, it certainly helps that it's delicious ice cream and, and whatever, but we're, we're not selling a product per se. You know, Ben would say that the strongest bond you form with people is over shared values. It's not a clever marketing campaign with attractive people or, you know, a humorous whatever. That those shared values are, are what keep us all connected and, th and that's what motivates us, that's, that's what keeps us working together. And you know, as was being said before we got on, it's not easy, right? It's, it's tough stuff. I, you know, that, that's kind of another thing that, that I think has been coming up more for Ben and Jerry's is uh, making sure we have joy with the justice that sometimes it's hard work. I mean, often it's hard work and uh, I mean, it came up for me the other, the other week also. Ben and Jerry's recently started a campaign uh, in Georgia around voter suppression and voter rights, working with a group, uh, Black Voters Matter. And when we did this event, Black Voters Matter gave us, uh, you know, some swag. We got the T-shirts, whatever. And... And one of the t-shirts that really struck me was this t-shirt that said, spreading love, building power. And you know, that's kind of like the joy and the justice that yes, it's based on love. Yes, it's based on spirituality and caring about our neighbors. And at the same time, we need to build power to do it. Mm -hmm. We can't, we can't not, we can't shy away from it. I hear people in the food security world pretty angry sometimes these days. I mean, there's more than enough food in the world, and yet a historic number of people are going hungry. Um, it really is frustrating to see that situation. In a minute, we're going to talk to people from USAID and from the UK government mm -hmm. who work on this. And, um, you know, it's frustrating to think, why can't we break through this? Why, why are we still making a case for what feels like the crumbs? Uh, when 
it's so obvious that this problem is here, it's in front of us and it's getting worse. Yeah, how do you keep that, that sense of optimism and joy and ambition in a moment like that? What, what's your, your advice for this world? Uh, well, I'll go back to what we were talking about earlier, connection, that we're not gonna do it alone. We have to connect with people who are like-minded, who are, who are in the movement with us. Uh, you know, I think the, the enemy for all of us is isolation and pessimism. And, and certainly one of the great joys for me is having a partner like Ben, who we've, we've been in this for, you know, 40 some odd years together. Uh, you gotta buddy up. You guys got buddies out there, and uh, we're, we're all in it together, right? I mean, it's sort of in the title, together, right? Together against hunger. You so, got it. Well, I want you all to join me in thanking Jerry Greenfield. What a great pleasure to get to talk to you. And congratulations on everything you've done. You're a real pioneer, and I think you've given us a lot to be inspired about and to think about as we go forward today. Thank, thank you. Thank you, and I, I want to thank all you guys again. I mean, it's just incredible. Thank you so much for what you're all doing. Fabulous. That was fantastic, and, and as I mentioned, we're going to continue on this theme, but now we're going to get into some of what two really critical agencies are doing and the perspectives of two leaders from those agencies on this fight against hunger. Uh, I want to welcome to the virtual stage. Hi guys, I hope you can see me. Uh, Sarah Charles, who is the Assistant Administrator at USAID and of course leads the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance there. And Terry Sarch, who is the Nutrition Team Leader at the UK government's FCDO, their, their Foreign Development uh, Agency. And uh, it's just a real pleasure to get to be with the two of you, even virtually, uh, to talk about such an important set of issues. Maybe we can just start kind of at a high level. And Sarah, maybe I'll just start with you. You know, we're, the, the theme of this conference is that we're in a different moment when it comes to, to food, right? There's a real crisis happening. We use that term a lot, but things are different now than they were, say, a couple of years ago. Um, give us your kind of overall lay of the land of where we are right now and what we're doing about it. Yeah, and thank you, Raj, for bringing us together, and, and thank you, Terry, for being here. A really hard act to follow, um, follow Jerry, um, but really glad to be able to dive in on some of these issues. I think we do, um, we are in an exceptional moment of crisis, of compounding crisis. This this group knows that well, um, and I think we have um, have the attention in many ways of, of key actors in the space. I. Um, notwithstanding DevX's excellent events, I'm often a, a, a bit of a UN General Assembly high-level week skeptic, but I think this year we really were able to mobilize attention and focus on what is a global, a global food crisis and specifically a crisis um, in wasting and a crisis in, in childhood malnutrition and made some really exciting exciting progress in terms of mobilizing resources um, and attention for addressing the childhood wasting crisis over um, over half a billion dollars raised between the US investments, um, other bilateral donors like Canada, the Netherlands, Ireland, um, and critically foundation investments to, um, to really increase coverage of wasting globally um, and, and really importantly, sustain attention and focus um, and drive reform in this space. Terry, I know we're gonna talk with you in a moment as well about wasting, but I just wanna get your high level take too about the situation that we're in. I mean, part of it has to do with Russia's war in Ukraine and the, what that has done to supply chains uh, for wheat and sunflower oil and other essential products in, in the food system. Part of it is just prices going up around the world. You know, Oil and gas prices are high, fertilizer prices are high, it's hard to get. How do you describe the situation that we're in when it comes to the food crisis? Why are we in it exactly? And, and how are you seeing it play out in the different contexts where FCDO works? Well, um, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me along to talk uh, this morning or the For focusing attention on this issue, just 
as Sarah said, we are really concerned about the hunger crisis in the world today. And in particular, we have an unprecedented malnutrition crisis. Really like to congratulate USAID on the lead that they've taken um, in focusing on child wasting in particular. Um, we are particularly worried. We think there are almost 9 million children um, in ten, only 10 countries that we're particularly worried about uh, that are severely wasted. And we see the price of treating them, the ready to use therapeutic foods has already gone up by 16% and, and rising further and further. Now, some of this is to do with the Russia-Ukraine crisis, but you know the numbers of Hungary were increasing before that, and um, you know that's only part of the reason for it. So we're really concerned and really uh, you know pleased and relieved that we are focusing on child wasting because a focus on food aid is not enough. Bags of grain and soy cannot save malnourished infants. They need ready-to-use therapeutic foods. Um, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about yeah. wasting well, as we, uh, Terry, as we let me, carry on. I'll talk more about that too. Thanks. Yeah, let's just continue on wasting. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what you think of some of the root causes are for these 9 million children. You know, obviously micronutrient deficiency is part of this picture. Is it, is it that you're seeing families not be able to access the food they normally would provide to children and therefore are substituting for other foods? that don't provide the same level of nutrition? or what, What's really going on that's, that's leading to this level of wasting? Well, I mean, I think part, it's only partly to do with food insecurity because, of course, you know, young children need uh, a lot of attention when they're growing up and they need health systems and health services and clean water uh, to make sure that they um, you know, have, have what they need and we need, we need to see health services integrating uh, monitoring of young children and pregnant women and what they do too. And that's all part of building resilience to food insecurity and hunger and other climate uh, threats to people's livelihoods. Um, and I guess the really big point I want to make here is that, you know, it's really good to focus on child wasting in this crisis, but it's not just uh, an issue during humanitarian crises. Uh, more children... Uh, are living or surviving with wasting in stable development contexts. Um, you know, but the, re the reality is where there's high rates of child wasting, you, um, you make those communities are much more at risk of famine. Um, and we can't just rely, but we can't just rely on short-term humanitarian funding for them. We need to think about how we can pre prevent and treat and integrate treatments into the sort of health systems to really build resilience more generally. Sarah, that's often a challenge, right? You lead a humanitarian agency. You know, Terry is here talking about health systems, and we live in this very siloed world. Maybe you could just start with your take on why the wasting challenge is getting so much worse, and then I'd love to hear too what you think some of those solutions might be. Yeah, I mean. Raj, you and Terry both hit on on certainly the accelerant that the war in Russia, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, has put on what was already um, kind of crisis levels of, of food insecurity. I've I've done a fair amount of travel over the summer, including to the Horn, um, and most recently to Pakistan. And the you know the other piece of this is we're seeing even in middle income countries the cost of um, the cost of debt servicing, the cost of um, a lot of governments choosing to subsidize fuel and other core um, core staples um, is really, in, in some ways, coming at the expense of investments in maintenance of municipal water systems. It's coming at the expense of paying community health workers. And so we're seeing, again, even in middle-income countries, a degradation of some of those basic services that are um, fueling, uh, fueling disease um, and undermining um, even, even in places where there, there were kind of effective um, malnutrition responses, that those are really being degraded now because of these competing, um, competing demands for very limited um, government budgets. And I hear the news coming out of um, Saudi Arabia um, from OPEC Plus um, this week is just going to be even more of an accelerant on, on this crisis, driving prices even higher. Which is um, a cut in, yeah, cut in oil production for people who aren't familiar, yeah. which is going to probably raise prices again. 
and certainly, you know, certainly we want to see a transition into more sustainable um, energy, but in the very short term, again, I think this is going to put more pressure on governments to subsidize things like fuel um, and divert more resources from basic public health interventions, malnutrition interventions, um, water and sanitation investments. And we're already seeing, I mean, uh, to call it a canary in the coal mine is probably inaccurate, but 26 countries, I think maybe now up to 28 countries um, uh, with cholera outbreaks right right now. Uh, last year, you know, it's we've, we've almost never seen more than 20 countries with cholera, cholera in places like like Lebanon, uh, most recently in Haiti. I mean, the, these are um, these are devastating, devastating indicators of again that breakdown uh, breakdown in basic services. Yeah, this tension between the short term and the long term is right in front of us. I was at the World Bank IMF annual meetings yesterday, and you're absolutely right. You know, countries are looking for funding to fill these really immediate gaps: fuel subsidies, you know, in Egypt, wheat subsidies, bread subsidies. Um, and as you say, then this means maybe there isn't money for clean water and kids are getting diarrheal disease from dirty water and that certainly makes this problem worse and then the two of you and your agencies and many here in this room have to spring into action to provide ready to use therapeutic foods to solve a humanitarian crisis that maybe could have been solved had the systems worked to begin with. What are your thoughts about how we get out of this mess? <laughs> uh, Terry, maybe you have, you have a perspective uh, People in this room who have been working on this for many years are looking at this crisis and thinking, how do we balance the long and the short term? How do we deal with the emergency but build the right systems? Do you have any thoughts about how you're doing that at FCDO or what other groups can do? Yeah, well, Sunny, I wanted to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about um, our partnership with UNICEF. And we have been working with them to think about new ways of preventing and treating child wasting in particular, um, a new ways to sort of strengthen the supply chains, uh, strengthen government-led action, and also to advocate for policy shifts that better address wasting. Um, and I wanted to talk, um, you know, about a couple of examples of uh, new things that we've been trying out with UNICEF. And as you know, um, you know, government, certainly in the UK and other countries, are sort of the COVID pandemic and now the Russia-Ukraine war is really uh, squeezing the amount of aid that we have, but we are really um, trying to focus on uh, preventing and treating child wasting and nutrition and thinking really hard about the value for money and how we can make the funding that we do have go further. So one of the, um, the first example I wanted to talk about was the Nutrition Match Fund, and it's something that um, FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, launched with UNICEF last year. And what the fund does is it matches domestic contributions for uh, therapies for child wasting one-to-one. -one. So the fund essentially aims to prompt domestic governments, uh, for example, in Mauritania, Nigeria, Senegal, Uganda, Kenya, to encourage them to use their government budgets to invest in preventing and treating child wasting and what the fund does is match their contributions um, and that's been quite successful. We've made uh, contributions to it but more recently so has the Children's Investment Fund Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and we're, we're really optimistic that that fund is going to take off and it's going to encourage governments to you know, invest in treating and preventing uh, child wasting in particular. And that's long been um, a challenge, getting governments, finance ministries to say nutrition is a priority, we'll invest in it, uh, versus other government budget priorities. So that's that's a really interesting development. Yeah. Um, and, and then there's another initiative that we're um, working on with UNICEF as well, something called the Vaccine Independence Initiative. And what we've been able to do is to evolve that so that it can provide uh, pre-finance, pre-financing. So some countries where they're waiting for money to come through, they can uh, borrow some money from the fund to buy in supplies to treat child wasting earlier. Um, and it helps sort of manage those temporary budget shortfalls. And, and UNICEF uh, has been able to support Ethiopia and Haiti um, to sort of procure more than you know, $5 million worth of ready-to-use therapeutic food. So that's, an, you know, another example of how sort of thinking innovatively, um, thinking about ways to sort of streamline and improve the uh, delivery of services and products to 
treat child wasting. Yeah, yes. Sarah, that makes me wonder whether USA's localization agenda aligns with this at all when you think about limited budgets, growing need, trying to get more for less. Uh, is there a connection here when you think about your work to try to address wasting or other issues around undernutrition? Yeah, I think specifically on wasting, it's both driving efficiency and effectiveness. So there's the dual pieces. There's partnering um, with, with organizations like Action Against Hunger on operational resources, investing in the development of simplified approaches um, where we've really been able to build the evidence base for approaches that kind of move treatment out of centers into communities, into families, um, and, and working closely with, with governments where, where these approaches are, are, being, um, are being piloted to, to scale those approaches, again, to get greater coverage, greater efficiency. And then it's also the localization piece. So in places like Kenya, working directly with organizations like Reseda, like the Kenyan Red Cross, in a direct financing relationship, not through many different layers of, of UN. Um, we love our, our NGO partners um, and our UN partners, um, but working directly with local organizations on, on, um, on delivery of, of assistance, on, on co-creation um, and design of very localized uh, approaches that are you know, coordinated with the wider system, but again, led by local organizations. One, one obvious driver of this crisis, it's a longer term driver, but it's climate. And we talk a little bit about fuel prices, fossil fuel prices, and how that's kind of part of the immediate crisis that we're in. But I wonder if you could both talk a little bit about the nexus with climate and how people who work on food security, work on ending hunger, should think about aligning with climate efforts and where those connections exist, if at all. Again, I know we live in a very siloed world within our various agencies, but how, how might we start thinking about this? Terry, do you, do you have any perspective? Yes, sure. Um, well, first of all, like you and I, I'm sure everyone in the room, we're really concerned about um, the consequences that are facing people and the planet due to the sort of food climate nexus. Um, we see climate change is already adversely affecting diets and nutrition and health through the impacts on both the quantity and the quality, diversity, affordability of food, and we know that this disproportionately impacts the most marginalized populations, and particularly women and children in low and middle income countries. Um, and you will have seen, I'm sure, modeling from IFPRI that about 70 million more people will be at risk of hunger because of climate change by 2050, um, including 28 million in East and Southern Africa. Um, and in, indeed, WFP, uh, anticipates that the majority of child deaths expected to occur as a result of climate change will be driven by undernutrition in particular. Um, so I, I did want to be a bit positive about this. Um, I wanted to sort of highlight some areas where you know, I think we are making progress. Um, and in particular, the sort of the recognition of the linkages between climate and hunger and nutrition and the real growing ambition that we've seen to address both these issues together through food systems transformation. And, you know, just this week, um, uh, currently happening as we, we're talking now, the, the Committee on Wild Food Security in Rome is focusing on food and climate action together. Um, we're also weeks away from COP27, where, we'll be see, where we will see the first ever food pavilion, um, which is great. Um, and you know, looking at nutrition in particular, we're seeing coalitions such as the Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems Coalition. We've got the Eat Lancet 2.0 underway. And we're hoping that both of these will sort of deliver um, focus and ideas on the ways forward where we can bring things together. And certainly in the UK, we're supporting a global youth movement called the Act for Food, Act for Change campaign. Um, and, you know, we're really uh, encouraging young people to take up uh, the initiative and advocate for change uh, and do it themselves. So there's just a sense of, yes, it's a really big problem. There are lots of links. It's complicated to tackle them together. And I think, as Jerry said, uh, just before we came on, you know, we really have to got to buddy up together. And uh, we, you know, that's how we see uh, that's what we need to do to move forward. Thanks. Sarah, do you, do you have any take on this food climate nexus and what you'd like to see happen? Yeah, and, and maybe 
you know, to start with one place where I think we have broken down the silos and that's on, on the science side. And, you know, we've, um, we've long invested really over the last two decades in, um, in partnership with, with kind of the, the acronym soup in the United States, NOAA, USGS, uh, National Weather Service, um, NASA, and others to kind of get the best of American science in the hands of uh, national weather services in, in Asia and Africa and Latin America, um, and then get that, that information um, really in the hands of people at a community level to make decisions about um, everything from planting to evacuation ahead of early storms or, or flooding. And I think we have made you know, tremendous progress in that kind of early warning side with, uh, side with more, more to come in terms of our efforts to expand coverage of, of early warning. Um, you'll be hearing more about that um, as we approach COP. But, you know, I think that is, that is a success story. And we've, we've seen, um, particularly, you know, in the hydrometeorological space, um, but also with things like the famine early warning system, um, really, really significant improvements in our ability to early warn. And it's why we, you know, we can say, unfortunately, with some degree of confidence, we're facing a 66% chance of a sixth failed rain um, in, in the horn. Now, the key is translating that early warning to early action. Um, and I think we still have a lot of work to do to break down the silos in the financing space. So, um, you know, over the last decade, again, coming out of lessons learned from the 2011 famines, I think uh, a lot of um, co-planning um, and co-investment in the humanitarian and the development space around resilience in places like the Horn. But those investments are helpful in withstanding and have helped reduce loss of life in the kind of early phases of this particular crisis. Um, but their you know, resilience investments help you, um, help you withstand uh, shocks, not, not kind of the type of devastating you know, again, for lack of a better metaphor, earthquake that we're seeing right now. Right. And what we what we still need is that much greater connectivity between those resilience investments, the humanitarian work, and climate adaptation financing. I, I was in Turkana um, a, a, about two months ago, which is an area where I actually started my career and is very used to kind of drought cycles. And I was so struck unlike 15, 20 years ago, when I would talk to people in these communities, they're not asking for restocking right now. They're asking for support to think about a, you know, a very different kind of future. Um, and to date, those climate adaptation investments aren't necessarily reaching the people who are really most, most vulnerable to, to climate shocks. Yeah, that's right. I think it's a really good point for us to wrap up on because in a way, what this community is trying to do in building a movement is to highlight exactly that point that, okay, we know the horn is vulnerable. We know what the disaster will be in human lives and economic costs and political dysfunction costs, geopolitical and instability, et cetera, if we let happen what we believe will happen, what, the, what all of the analysis shows is likely to happen. And we know how much less expensive it is in all those senses if you do it now. But somehow we've got to build that movement to get that done early, to break those silos, to work together as one community to end hunger. So I think that's a great theme for us to wrap up our conversation on. Sarah Charles, Terry Sarch, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to all of you. It's been a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you.